I don't think I need to say how excited I am to be to have uh, to have this panel and uh, and this session, which is a very relevant to an existential crisis that we are all facing. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody who's joining us across the world. Uh, uh, as you know, there is this this panel is at the same time on the same topic of COP27, and this is not by chance. This is showing the importance of the of the problems that we are facing, and in any discipline, we are trying to uh, uh, to engage in this in this problem and solve this problem. So the importance of these topics for us at the John Grill Institute of uh, uh, project leadership, as Jennifer has emphasized, is evident by having a research stream on projects for sustainable, just, and resilient future. So without going into further, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Nader Nader Pajiu. I'm a senior lecturer and director of research education uh, at the School of Project Management. And uh, with me, I have uh, Martina Linenluke professor at Macquarie University, where she leads the Center for Corporate Sustainability and Environmental Finance. Uh, Marcus Helgren, uh, professor of management and organization at UMIA School of Business and Economics. And Chris Queen, uh, who is the director of uh, Resilient uh, Projects. And before starting the discussion with this esteemed panel, uh, I would like to start with the discussion that we initiated in the call for paper that Jennifer has, uh, has referred to on project leadership and society. And in that call, we started the argument that uh, projects do not have a good track record. Uh, they have been used extensively as a form of organizing that has led uh, to these global grand challenges that, that we are facing. So these large projects often have focus on short-term gains in both the developed and developing countries and uh, disrupted the communities and their natural environment. So what we are trying to achieve in this discussion is, is uh, we would like to explore how can we change this track? Uh, how do projects in the changing work look like? And what do we expect uh, in, the space of the, uh, in the space of the project management? So without going further, I would like to start with our first panel, panel, panelist, uh, 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 Professor Martina Linenluke. And, I would like to ask you, Martina, that uh, you have been engaged with uh, International Panel for Climate Change, and, uh, and I would like to refer uh, to the last report that you were also one of the co-authors. Uh, one of the underlying messages that we had on that report was that uh, they, were, they were calling it no or never, uh, asking for immediate, sizable, and meaningful action. So looking at this report as a bold signal that, uh, that uh, the, uh, emphasize for us that there is a need for a drastic change, what do you see as the role of projects in, in such transition? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Nada. So yeah, as you mentioned, um, I was a contributing author to the uh, sixth assessment report of working group two. So focusing in particular on uh, adaptation um, impacts vulnerability of climate change. So there's certainly when you look at the report, the IPCC report, there's certainly no shortage of references to various type of uh, types of projects, uh, for instance, uh, adaptation projects, mitigation projects, clean energy projects, and so on. So the sort of like project idea is very much embedded, I think, you know, in, in trying to achieve different uh, future outcomes here. So in terms of, you know, what we kind of see when it comes to these types of projects, um, we see references to projects that have worked very well, certainly in, in achieving desirable outcomes. But there are certainly also uh, a lot of examples, you know, where we see maladaptation, for instance, or ultimately, you know, the um, desired outcomes were not really delivered or not really delivered within the, um, you know, desired timeframes. So just sort of thinking about this, right? Um, I guess one of the questions here is, you know, how do projects potentially impact, you know, our ability to achieve um, a different future or transition to net zero, um, which is very important at the minute. But on the other hand, we also see the question around how is climate change, for instance, impacting projects. So we kind of have a flip side here as well. 
just looking at, uh, I think, three short points that I wanted to make here, right? One of the underlying questions is certainly if projects are the right vehicle to achieve uh, the desired outcomes. And I guess, you know, the, the answer to that question is probably a little bit, it depends, right? We see some great uh, success stories in terms of, you know, projects being able to deliver successful sustainability outcomes, for instance, you know, future energy projects and so on. But um, we also see a lot of examples where projects are perhaps very infrastructure focused, you know, not really embedded within what the local community needs um, and potentially leading to maladaptation and especially very difficult when it comes to managing that nexus for so for instance we we see complexities around managing the water energy food or health nexus and i think sometimes projects really fail to deliver here um Two other points are certainly around the temporal nature of projects and also the spatial nature of projects. So one of the questions here is whether or not uh, projects can sort of lead to that sustained um, future change that we really need. We see a lot of delays in projects, unfinished projects and so on. But, you know, the question certainly is also can we actually scale projects up? Um, fast enough, large enough to really kind of bring the transitions that we need um, globally, right? Or are there essentially just locally embedded solutions and perhaps not the right vehicles uh, to, to bring about change? So yeah, just a few points and questions uh, to my, from my side. Um, and yeah, I know the other panelists have probably uh, some, some additional views on that. So thank you. Thanks, Martina. And probably that's a good segue that uh, we go directly to Marcus. And uh, Marcus, I want to see in the context that Martina was was explaining, what do you think are the challenges uh, with the use of projects? Uh, and especially Martina was referring to the fact that in some contexts, uh, uh, projects might not be the, the right vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think I have kind of a gloomy picture of projects and a gloomy view of them. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, and the thing is, I mean, as Martina is pointing out, I mean, projects could be the most amazing thing and a way to kind of produce energy, motivation, and passion. And, and we need that in order to, um, to address the climate, right? We, we need that in order to produce change. And projects have definitely done that. I mean, the Sydney Opera House comes to mind, I mean, as a, as a kind of construction achievement, but also the quick development of the COVID-19 vaccines. I mean, that's the kind of an amazing achievement in and by itself. And also social change, such as Me Too and so on. I mean, temporary organization, if we, think about projects as temporary organizations. It have achieved fantastic stuff. But on the other hand, also as Martina is pointing out, I mean, projects could also potentially be the most dangerous way of organizing there is. Uh, and it can produce death and, and destruction. I mean, uh, the Manhattan Project come to mind. I mean, it produced the, uh, the nuclear bombs and thousands of people died. and. Some of our own research, where we looked at mountaineering expeditions and K2 in specifically, where 11 out of 27 climbers died in 2008, what we see is that the reason why so many climbers died and was actually attributed to the temporary organizational projects because the climbers, really professional, really good climbers, they knew what they were doing. They were pushing past the different margins that they had and decided to continue. And by that, they also reduced their margins and they, they died. A lot of them died, 11 out of 27. And I would argue that in projects, we are taught to use smart goals. You know, they should be specific, they should be measurable, they should be acceptable and yada yada. But this kind of short-term goals are producing the problems that we are seeing with the, with the projects as well, with the temporary organizations because it limits our attention and creates a tunnel vision where we push too hard towards the goal. It motivates us and all research teaches us that, well, short-term goals are motivating and it actually increases our risk willingness. So we take larger risks just in order to reach the short-term goal, forgetting about the long-term goal. 
And finally, it creates uh, temporary organizations, projects create accountability. And we don't want to lose. We, as, as humans, we don't want to lose. We don't want to kind of be on the bad side. And through this, we are kind of pushing towards the short-term goal, forgetting about the long-term goal which means that projects will have a problem addressing the long-term challenges that we see in the, in the climate. Uh, I think they could be a part, but they are definitely not the uh, one and only solution. They are not the silver bullet. Sorry about the gloomy image here, but there's two sides to it. Thanks you. Thanks. This is a very critical view of the of the projects as a vehicle, and I can see that it has already dis uh, started some discussion in the uh, in the chat that we would go to them. And I would like to encourage everybody, if there is any discussion and question, please uh, uh, please put put it in the chat, and we would we would get to the question as much as uh, uh, we can. So I would like to take this and 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 uh, and uh, go to Chris, and I would like to ask you. What shifts have you observed in the context of projects in a, in a, in a changing world? So, in uh, so so Martina and Marcus have have suggested about what we might and we might uh, uh, we might not have. Uh, uh, what have you observed? That, that's a great question, Nada. Um, I, I guess uh, I'll take a. Um, I'll take a leaf out of Margaret's book and just uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today too. Uh, I'm in Townsville, so um, I'm very fortunate to have a beautiful sunny location that's the home of the Woogara, Kapar and Bindle people. So uh, lots of respect to elders past, present, future. Um, I, I guess some... Um, it, the, it's all very interesting, and I, I really thank Martina and Marcus for giving such a great introduction to this idea of projects. I was put in mind of two particular things when we were listening to – gloomy is probably the wrong word. I, I think sceptical is a great word, and I think, Marcus, having some scepticism in relation to projects is a very healthy thing. Um, I was put in mind of two things. I was put in mind uh, of a book – by a terrific uh, project manager who, who very critical and analytical around projects, a gentleman by the name of Ed Merrow over in the United States. And he has a terrific book called um, uh, Why Mega Projects Fail. Uh, and, it, and it has a lot of information about the mechanics of projects and why they fail. And I think it's really helpful to understand that, I think, when we're talking about um, some of the successes and some of the failures that projects have delivered to us. And then um, along the lines of one of our commentators in the uh, in the chat box, there was a good uh, there was a good comment about um, how people be, are behind projects. And projects are the means to achieving the outcome. And the the phrase that entered my mind, and I hesitate to share this one because it comes straight from Hamlet, which is um, one of Shakespeare's potentially um, most contentious plays. But there's a line in that of uh, nothing is good nor evil, yet thinking makes it so. And I think that's true of projects. I think. You know, we, we can we can enumerate many projects on our hands where they were incredibly efficient and well organised, but they were they were deliberately poor outcomes for humanity. Um, and and you did mention some of those, Marcus. Um, and we can also enumerate plenty of projects. You know, children's hospitals and um, you know all sorts of other infrastructure that have had wonderful outcomes for humanity. And I, I think the um, I think the coronavirus vaccine is a particularly good one too, Marcus. It's humanity coming together to. Uh, to, to produce incredible outcomes in a short period of time. So, so I think the projects um, themselves uh, are, are a vehicle, but it's the people behind them. It's the thinking behind them that really um, gives us some of these poor outcomes. And I was very encouraged by some of the... Um, uh, some of the comments. So Martina told us it was it was effectively now or never, which is absolutely true. It's it's critical at this moment in time to pay attention to the IPCC sixth report. Um, it's incredibly uh, important to think along those um, future lines, and I think all all of the speakers today have have talked about that. So I think that long term thinking and. The, the way I look at it from the change, sorry, I am going to answer your question at some stage, Nada, is uh, uh, from the change, I think, you know, 40 years ago, we didn't see very much consideration of environmental impacts of projects. If we wanted to build a freeway or an electricity line, or we just built it. We, we didn't care. And so what happened is environmental regulations came along and they made us pause. They made us think about the natural environment, what we were building over, the impacts that we were having, um, albeit in potentially limited ways. And they were looked at as restrictive at the time. But over time, the culture has changed and we're seeing 
more projects take their environmental responsibilities seriously. And I think this has led to a sustainability uh, focus on some projects um, and, and uh, not all projects. I realise there are still hard money contractors who don't follow uh, necessarily these lines, but I think sustainability has been the path. And, and of course, the, we're talking about today about projects for resilience in a changing world. And I think resilience can follow that same path that sustainability has. So where sustainability is pretty much an accepted idea, I think we're still in that germination process with resilience to some extent um, to, to get it as a more accepted idea. So, and I think many things are happening in that space, you know, task force for uh, climate related financial disclosures, um, um, the investor group on climate change closer to home in Australia and New Zealand, all of these organisations are, are, are trying to link um, the capital that we all need to, to produce projects um, with the longer term thinking and the outcomes that we'd like to see as a result. So do no harm, but also improve the current situation. And projects should always be looking to leave the world as a at least a slightly better place. And I think we are seeing that happen. So that, that's a change I've seen over a long period in project management. Um, uh, thanks, Chris. I, I think if I want to frame the discussion so far, there was this criticism of the of the project or critical look at the project uh, from from inside and then you also discussed about some of these mechanisms and i can see in the in the chat box there is a lot of discussions that they are uh, saying uh, is there is there anything inherent uh, uh, with the projects or is there the intention or as you chris you mentioned the people behind the projects who are making this happen so i would like to take the discussion in that direction as as uh, i i saw the three comments were also relatively aligned and ask you martina do you think there is any uh, structural issues with the projects uh, and and if it is how can we make it work yeah, thanks. I think that's a really interesting question, actually, right? I think, you know, as, as Marcus pointed out, what we would ideally like to see from projects, right, is that they bring this energy, the motivation, passion, right? And I guess any type of project that is essentially not managing to really harness this sort of collective power and collective achievement towards a certain outcome, is always at risk of not really delivering what is required. And I think that can be potentially a large number of factors playing into this. You know, I mean, when you have a look at uh, online and just search for failed uh, clean energy projects, for instance, right, there's absolutely no shortage of examples, right? But that's not limited just to this sector, right? We find that with, with pretty much, you know, every other sector. So this is not just something that is common here to, to renewable energy, I would like to say, right? We certainly see that with other infrastructure projects as well, right? When we think about, I mean, I'm currently over in Germany, but we had a lot of delays uh, with a certain airport here, um, you know, that that took many, many years to actually come to, to fruition. So, you know, it's it's not just the, the clean energy projects, I guess, but, you know, given that this is like one of the kind of central interest uh, areas at the moment, right, I guess I comment on that as well. And certainly also adaptation and, and uh, mitigation projects as well, right? So what we often said, and as Chris already said, you know, there are many examples, you know, where especially large or so-called mega projects uh, are at risk of, of failing. And that's, that's very well documented, sometimes just due to the sheer size complexity and I guess also human inability to really map out all the different stages and potential setbacks uh, that can happen throughout such a different project. But even on smaller scales, we see this, right? It can be poor planning. It can be a poor definition of the outcomes that are meant to be achieved, especially if we kind of think about um, projects that are being placed into the developing, in developing countries where they might have been, you know, planned in developed countries, for instance, with Without really integrating the local knowledge or local cultural considerations. But we certainly also have, you know, difficulties around sometimes really, um, you know, um, defining the exact outcomes that are meant to be achieved when it comes to resilience, for instance, right? Resilience is, can be a very broad term in itself. So what exactly is meant to be achieved here? Who is meant to be more resilient or what part of society is more resilient? And we often see that in discussions around resilience, that it's not necessarily a uniform concept that will apply to everyone equally, right? There are real inequalities, you know, and some groups in society might just simply benefit more. For instance, I've just been working with colleagues on a project that has been looking at this nexus between, you know, climate change 
adaptation, but also trying to achieve um, outcomes, you know, such as gender equality at the same time. And that's not something that is usually factored into decision making, right? So a lot of additional challenges there as well to kind of achieve more than one sustainable development goal potentially, right? And that already introduces a lot of complexities in terms of bringing in all the necessary um, stakeholder groups to really see, okay, what, what's the desired outcome? How do we define resilience? What type of resilience is meant to be approved against what type of hazard? Um, and I guess, you know, we are also at this sort of uncertain time where, you know, it can be also very risky to plan only for one particular type of hazard. Um, I think we are seeing that increasingly, right? So in, in recent years, as examples, right, in Australia, we've gone through the bushfires, we've gone through flooding, we've gone through COVID, right? Now we, we are facing additional issues when it comes to, you know, um, um, cost of living, for instance, right? Uh, energy affordability and so on, right? So I guess sometimes when we sort of think about resilience, it's also very kind of multifaceted concept and requires consideration that there might be multiple different hazards happening and not just narrowly achieving one type of specific outcome, right? So I think there's also a need to just kind of apply a broader lens when it comes to, you know, really considering um, especially how we achieve resilience. And I think all of that can be extremely difficult to achieve if we try to do this all just within this sort of like one project, right? So I think what's required there, and, you know, it might not be possible, right? I'm not saying we need to have a project that is delivering on all of this. So I think there is a real need to kind of see also how different projects can work together over time to perhaps address a multitude of challenges, how they can be integrated in a meaningful way. And I think certainly, you know, the temporal dimension is um, is very, very important also with the view towards, I think projects also need to be designed in a way that we have sort of, you know, this this responsiveness to, to future uncertainty in there as well, right? So we might want to prepare for one particular issue in 2020, but then, you know, we might end up in 2025 and the issue is no longer the same, right? So I guess there's a question as well, how we can change potentially, you know, or adapt projects as well to to perhaps be be more responsive to a multitude of different uh, challenges as well. Thanks, Martina. So, so the message I'm getting from from you is that uh, uh, is that we are facing a more uncertain and complex situation. And and uh, I want to add to that that uh, probably a lot of us would agree that projects uh, did not have track record in in addressing even simpler pro problems. So we need a we need a probably a bigger leap, a major uh, major paradigm shift if we want to address these uh, complexities. And if I want to take this and to the role of project leaders in, in such a context. Uh, Marcus, I would like to uh, hear how you define the role of pro uh, project leaders in the context that Martina was uh, was setting, especially in view of studies that you had in uh, leadership in extreme context. Yes, thank you. It's a good question. Um, again, I wanna be a little bit against the grain, correct? In a way, and uh, I'm not sure that we should, or perhaps a little bit unpack, what do we mean by leadership? Do we mean the project leader or do we mean leadership? In the sense that I don't think it's about the project leader. It's not about an individual and how to do that, but right? it's about getting a team to work together to accomplish things, to harness the competences of everyone around, including stakeholders and so on. That's the only way to kind of move outside of the project, outside of the temporary organization, if one will, and also uh, address the complexities. Because one of the things that we know is that projects are good at addressing complexities compared to a permanent organization. But then again, you have this kind of temporary uh, temporariness that causes a little bit of hiccups in the organization. Uh, and also, I would like to point out that, I mean, in a crisis, such as the climate crisis, or the COVID, I don't know how Australia reacted to it, but at least in Sweden, we tended to look at kind of a single leader with simple answers or even simplistic answers in the sense that kind of just show up, tell us what to do and we will do it. And in a complex environment, it doesn't work 
because then we need to have the team to think together to address the local issues that we that we have to uh, account for those. Uh, my point would be that we need a, we need the team, and in order to uh, allow the team to flourish flourish we also need to have a very open culture where it's perfectly okay to say that no there might be a little bit more to this than what we're currently addressing we might head in the wrong direction uh we might head for the summit i see that we are heading for the summit but this is actually a problem we need to turn around guys or we need to do something else and i think that's the way to perhaps allow the organization to learn over time so we don't end up with an obsolete goal but we are actually adjusting to the goal uh to the long-term goal um and uh, this is also what we what we could see with the again going back to the example with the climbers on k2 the ones that actually survived they also had an open culture where a lot of them who turned around early they could question their decision and they could question each other, which then again made them to turn around. They made the right decision, uh, whatever the right decision is, but um, at least they survived. Uh, so my message is we shouldn't focus on the individual, on kind of the leader, but we should think about leadership and leadership from a team perspective. Uh, uh, the please second see. thing is that, sorry? Yes. No, please continue. Uh, yeah. The second thing is that I, in order to create this environment and get the team to function and get the organization to function and not head in the wrong direction, we need to be mindful about the little things. It's not only the kind of grand changes that we are doing, but it's actually in the activities that we have as individuals within the project, in, an, in a temporary organization. The little things are the important ones because that is what allows a gradual change over time. That allows us to notice the change before it has been become too much. Uh, and finally, then, and I think this is where the real challenge is: kind of how do we move from the project, the temporary organization, and allow the results to live? in a permanent sense in society, in the organization. And how do we kind of how, how do we address the long-term issues that projects are not designed to um, account for? Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you, and and uh, that's what I wanted to see when when you, uh, especially about your first point that uh, that uh, there is also a lot of increasing discussions about the socialized uh, leadership, as you were saying that uh, to uh, to see how this uh, leadership is happening within uh, within different uh, actors or uh, or different individuals and different groups who are involved uh, uh, in the in the project and i want to i want to segue from that and uh, and ask you chris uh, how different do you think is the context of project leadership in in a changing world as we call it uh, than the than the leadership as we know it in the in the business as usual I think Marcus has touched on that really well, uh, and he left me with one or two questions to answer, which I love too. Um, but he, he was saying that leadership isn't necessarily about one person leading a project, and that's certainly a change I've seen over a long period of time. Le leaders, leaders come from everywhere within a temporary organisation, such as a project, um, and it, it is about... Um, so I often think of leadership as warmth and strength. So the warmth part is you need to care about your team. You need to care about them as people. You need to care about the outcomes for the project. You need to care about the organization's outcomes. You need to care about the impact on the world. But you also need to have the strength to pursue the objectives and to be sceptical in the way that Marcus was describing, to question whether we are choosing the best outcomes and having an open project, a set of open project communications as we've discussed already, is allows that healthy scepticism, not necessarily cynicism, but certainly a healthy scepticism where leaders in the project can emerge and ask questions and, and, and those can 
can go to the sponsors. They can be um, discussed. They can be discussed within the team and decisions can be made that fulfil the, the project further. The, the harder question um, that Marcus left right at the end um, was about, uh, you know, the long-term impacts of projects. And in my mind, I think of that as making change stick. So projects are all about change and making change stick is tough, right? Um, and some of the projects that I do, we do, we do do infrastructure projects, but we do organisational projects as well around business continuity, emergency management and planning. And I refer to those as our hearts and minds projects. So those are the projects where we're looking for a culture shift. I, I think, especially in relation to resilience, we talked about resilience before as kind of a goal that you never reach, I think. You know, it's, it's, it's an objective that you want to obtain, but, it, but nobody gets the stamp that says, we are fully resilient, you know, fantastic, move on, do something else now. I think resilience is something we're pursuing. Martina talked about the changing face of resilience. As the world changes, the idea of resilience has to change. New threats emerge, you know, global pandemics, et cetera. So, so I think we refer to resilience as a maturity journey. And I think projects are a great way to step up that maturity. You know, if you if you look at it at a scale one to five, which of course it's not, but you know, in a in a in a in a bid to measure the maturity around resilience, we sometimes place some behaviors and some objectives and some outcomes in that scale of one to five. And and projects should be a way of moving from step one to step two or step four to step five, depending upon where the permanent organization or the permanent social structure or society is, you can use projects as to, to kind of take a step along that path to greater resilience, um, which is kind of a never-ending path. It's kind of a, a spiral or an iterative process to build resilience. So I, I think um, those questions were particularly good. I, I, th I, I often think, and this goes back to the conversation about the, um, the vehicle and the driver and those sorts of things. I think there's uh, someone that buys the car. I think there are, there's the destination that you're getting to in the car. I think the analogy is actually quite good when you talk about vehicles. But, but one of the most important things, we, we often use the, word, the, the terminology PPP to talk about um, you know, you know, private um, public-private partnerships or private-public partnerships in, in projects. But I think PPP should stand for people, people, and people because people come up with the ideas for projects. They see the problem that will be solved by the project. They see the change they want to see in the world. People execute the projects, and people are always the beneficiaries of the projects. We, we do a lot of natural hazard projects, and if, uh, if a storm or a cyclone crosses the coast in North Queensland, where there's very little population and no environment of significance and everybody breathes a sigh of release. And we say that was a hazard, but it wasn't a disaster. But if a project crosses the coast in the middle of a, of a city where there's lots of people and potentially old structures, pre 1980 structures before the building codes were, were improved after Cyclone Tracy, we, we see um, much damage and it becomes a disaster. So, so I think, you know, looking at resilience as a mechanism for disaster risk reduction is really useful. You know, going along that journey and trying to ensure that uh, we reduce the risk of a disaster is a really, really helpful way to look at resilience and, and looking at it as a maturity journey, a, unfortunately a never ending maturity journey, but still a maturity journey nonetheless, where we can uh, reduce that disaster risk and, and move on. I, I guess I'd like to sort of just say one thing to all of the people that are on the um, call at the moment, there's an infrastructure boom. So it's not just infrastructure, it's organisational projects. There's a boom at the moment of change. We all understand the need for change. So as project professionals, you actually have a lot of power in, in, in what is effectively a market um, to, to, to get your voices heard. So what I've seen many organisations that I consult into, I do project um, mentoring through the Australian Institute of Project Management, and they are listening to the young project professional. I say young, but anyway, uh, you know, young project professionals in that organisation who are interested in sustainability, who are interested in resilience. They want to retain their talent. So you might be part of an organisation that looks like it's a little bit cumbersome, a little bit old, but make sure your voice is heard because, uh, as Martina rightly pointed out, it's now or never. And, and organisations that are executing projects at the moment are very interested in retaining excellent people because projects, people, 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 right? So um, make your voice heard. Absolutely advocate for the change that you want to see in the world within your projects, within your organisations. And I think it might not be now, but I think we will take steps along that maturity path and potentially um, create a more sustainable, sustainable, resilient, and perhaps even a more just world, I hope. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we are almost at the end of our session. 
and uh, and uh, and I'll, I, I see very interesting discussions coming up in the in the chat. For example, there is a question that uh, they are asking: What other organizational forms are 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 there? For example, what are the alternatives to projects, and and what are they achieving? And there is another discussion that they are asking: For example, because projects are driven by the organization, is that uh, multi-level? Uh, view of seeing, for example, the incentives coming from the organization to the project uh, solving the, the 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 issue or not? Is it one of the uh, one of the solution to create the incentives that uh, that Marcus is uh, mentioning or not? So probably we have one minute. If any of the panel members want to uh, to quickly add a, 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 a silver bullet uh, <laughs> or maybe just a. Uh, just a point about these, uh, uh, especially these incentive mechanisms between organization and project. I have honestly no idea how to do this in under a minute, to be honest, because there's yeah. a lot of, that's, that, that's, uh, that's, you know, a lot of points there. I guess, you know, just, uh, just a couple of thoughts from my side, right? We see that projects are often motivated by crises. And that was also point mentioned on the discussion, right? And I think we probably need to look beyond that, that we don't just always react to a crisis, right? I think sometimes we also need to be better at abandoning unsuccessful projects. And lastly, in terms of alternative forms of organizing, there's, there's a lot of really interesting literature, you know, that looks at multi-level sort of developments within society, right, where essentially you have a lot of confluence amongst different actors on every different level, right, the individual, the organization, policymakers, and so on. And we see those societies that have that are sort of better at transitioning. Thanks a lot, Martina. And uh, and uh, we, we have, uh, this is very interesting because we are also living with a lot of questions. We came with some question, we, we leave it uh, with uh, more question. And again, uh, we would be more than happy to hear uh, if uh, the, if you want to reach out and, and continue the discussion to, to us and the, and the, and the panelists. Mm -hmm.